from the Acts of the Apostles. As the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the 12 called together the community of the disciples and said, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at table. Brothers, select from among you seven reputable men filled with the spirit and wisdom, whom we shall appoint to this task, whereas we shall devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 
The proposal was accepted to the whole community. So they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, come to him, a living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in it shall not be put to shame. Therefore, its value is for you who have faith, but for those without faith, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that will make people stumble, and a rock that will make them fall. They stumble by disobeying the word, as is their destiny. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may announce the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The, works, the words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Friends, Christ says today, do not let your hearts be troubled. And our hearts are often troubled. I learned the other day, one of our parishioners has the virus. Her heart was very troubled speaking to her. I was talking to a priest, and he was very troubled about some things. And our hearts can be troubled at times, and our Lord says, let not your hearts be troubled. Have faith in me. And in these times, it's a privileged time to see the divine dimension in our lives. And to throw off any self-reliance that we all cling to at times and abandon ourselves to the hands of our loving Father one more time. We often look out and see the trouble. We see the problems, right? We see the wind and the waves. Peter walking out to Christ, seeing the winds and the waves, he takes his eyes off of Christ and what happens? He begins to sink. Keeping our eyes trained on Jesus and on him, he will train us to keep it on the Father. Our Lord says today that if you see me, you see the Father. I will bring you to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and, and the life. And that's a majestic saying when we hear that every time we hear it. So the early century Jew, they would have often heard in the scriptures that God is the way. The Psalms are full of it. And that, the, and that God is the truth. And that God is the life. What is our Lord saying to us when he says today, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, first, that I am the way. He says, I am the way. You know, if you were to go out today and say, I need to get to Cleveland, or I need to get to Suchus, I need to get to Blairsville, and you ask somebody walking down the street, and they told you, well, go up here and take a left and take a right, and 
What would be the difference if they said to you, come, I'll show you the way. I'll go with you on the way. That's a wholesale difference, my brothers and sisters. Someone who's actually gonna go with you to your destination, not just point out the way, not just show you they know the way. They're gonna walk with you step by step to such as, to to, to Cleveland, to Blairsville. I will take you there. Our Lord is the way, he says. And this means we have great hope, right? Because our Lord is gonna go with it to the end with us. He's gonna go with us on the way to the end, to our destination, to the blessed Trinity. Our vocation is to be with the Trinity forever in heaven. And the second person of the blessed Trinity is gonna be our way, he's gonna go with us. Not just tell us the way, not just say I know the way. No, I am the way. So following him becomes what it means to be a disciple. And this sets Jesus apart from every other religious figure in the course of history categorically. Because no one says, I am the way. They may say they know the way, but only Jesus says, I am the way. So attachment to his person, following his person, becomes essential, becomes what it means to be a disciple. We have hope because God is this way. He gives himself to us to be the way. And Christ will say in the Gospel of St. John, right, much earlier than this passage, he will say, Amen, Amen, I say to you, you shall see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Our Lord compares himself to Jacob's ladder. Our brothers and sisters, we have a greater than Jacob's ladder. Here we have God incarnate himself, who's going to be our way. And we can sin against this hope. Maybe now we're tempted to sin against hope. The one way to sin against hope, right, is by presumption, what we call presumption, which is what? Essentially, it's hoping in ourself, right? That I'm sufficient, I'll figure it out, I can do this. We can't, my brothers and sisters. What does the faith teach us? It teaches us that no good work is possible without God's grace. No good work is pleasing to the Father unless we're in a state of grace, unless by God's grace it happens. Presumption, we can sin against this hope. And the other way we can sin against it is despair, which essentially is what? Is hoping in the things of this earth, which are good and given to us by God. But it is our perennial temptation to make a permanent location out of this world. Right? We want to make a permanent place, right? We want to make a permanent temple here. We want to make a permanent thing here for us. No. Our permanent place is with our Heavenly Father, with the God incarnate and the Holy Spirit. We want to make this life a lasting city. And we have to see with a clear vision. We need clear goals, right? To see that and appreciate all that God has given us in this world. But that's to say it is relative good. It is all relative to him. And it is all, everything we see, everything that we touch is all relative and subordinate to the highest good, which is eternal life for us. So what do we need to maintain this peace, right? We have to cooperate, to strive in our interior life, to stay faithful in the prayer, to do our daily examination of conscience, and to begin again and again with humility. To begin and to begin again, like our Lord was talking with Peter, with Philip and Thomas here today, right? How many times did they have conversations like this? And how many times can you see in this passage how exasperated our Lord is with them? But what, he has patience with them. And they began again. Our Lord didn't throw them off, and so too with us. To begin and begin again in humility, walking the way with Jesus. He is the way. And he says, I am the truth. I am the truth. Apart from Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, my brothers and sisters, there is no salvation. He is the unique Savior. There will not be another. And he is it. Christ and in Christ alone, says the catechism, is the fullness of truth. The fullness of truth. Truth draws its strength from nothing outside itself, but from itself. Not from the number of votes it gets in whatever political system you're in. Truth draws its strength from itself. You know, many in our, in our contemporary life, right, they have no stable life. They have no stable truth in themselves. Can you imagine what instability and what insecurity this brings them? We have to pray for them. Because for them, 
everything is essentially and equally valid. It's a dictatorship of relativism, which one of our holy fathers has said, a dictatorship of relativism where the highest value is placed on my ego. And if you resist this dictatorship, the penalty is high now, right? It is social excommunication, cast out and vilified by the others. But the greatest truth that we can ever contemplate is that God loves us. There's a God that he loves me personally. This is the greatest truth of our life. Apart from Jesus Christ risen from the dead, there can be no salvation. He is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and he is the life. My brothers and sisters, as you know, I've been reading the life of St. John Paul II. And this past week, I read the last days of his life. You remember them very well, I'm sure. If you were alive at that time, the world was really fixated upon what he was doing, the great witness to life that he showed us. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. I remember I was just a new Catholic, maybe just some months a Catholic. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is a man who preaches, who lives what he preaches. And he's going to follow and imitate Jesus to the end. And I got this sense, a real gift, I think, of, of the Lord, that as the weaker the Holy Father was becoming in his physical life, the stronger the church is becoming in her supernatural life. Just as from the cross, our Lord's physical life was getting weaker and weaker, so now pouring out in abundance with supernatural life upon the faithful, redemption, salvation, sanctification. The first words of St. John Paul II's will, which he would revise every year when he'd go on retreat, which is a great spiritual exercise, by the way, to contemplate our last, our last days, the first words in his will were, I wish to follow him. And Cardinal Ratzinger said at the homily at his funeral, he said that his life, in his life, the word cross is not just a word. He understood deeply that life is a gift. It was a gift to him to be returned to his heavenly father. And so that everything that happened to him along the way, ups and downs, and suffering in the end, all came from his loving Father. Our Lord is talking about the Father here. I am the way, the truth, and the life, the life to the Father. In his last hours in the Vatican, St. John Paul II asked that they do one thing, that they all sit and read and listen out loud to the Gospel of St. John, what we're reading here in the Gospel today. In fact, they only read that day up till nine chapters were here in chapter 14. But I was struck because I went back and I looked at chapter nine of St. John's Gospel. And then I looked at what chapter 10 was. You know what chapter 10 of St. John's Gospel is? It's about the Good Shepherd. St. John Paul II was giving his life then as a witness, one more witness, to be a Good Shepherd in the world, to be, to be incarnation of what Christ is for us, the Good Shepherd. His last hours were spent how he lived his life close to the scriptures. And for us too, the last moments of our life, probably we will do. And we will think what the majority of our life has been doing and thinking all along. The habits that we're building now will be what we rely upon when the going gets tough, when the crisis is there, right, in our life. And for him, for the saint, they nourished, they lived off the word which was way the truth and the life. And so too in the last moments of his life, he was living off that word again. My brothers and sisters, this life is to flow into the church in Easter, is to flow into you and to me, is to become effective in the world. The life is to overflow in the life of the body, which is you and me, the mystical body of Christ, and to flow into the world for the salvation of souls. Our Lord says this, really mysterious phrase here today, doesn't he, at the end of the gospel, it says, greater works than these. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. How mysterious is that? That we're to do the works of our Lord and greater ones than these. And if you go to the Acts of the Apostles, the birthday of the church, the birthday book of the church, I right, talked about today being Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the church, uh, to, all, to all of you in our church here today. The church is our mother. And she is born. 
and we celebrate her today too. What are these greater works, this mysterious greater works, right? Well, we see the apostles raising people from the dead. And you think about it, right? Peter's shadow will heal people. We never hear that about Christ. Doesn't mean he didn't do it, right? But we don't hear that about him. Paul, his handkerchief, his handkerchief, right? Remember in Acts, the apostles, his handkerchief, right? People want to get close to it because even touching that could heal a person. Some years ago, I was in Manchester, England, visiting a priest friend of mine, and spending the, the Easter Triduum there. And we went to one of the local hospitals and we met a young man by the name of Pedro Ballester. And he was there dying of bone cancer in the children's hospital. Young man, probably only 15, 16 years old. Already with a reputation for holiness. He had dedicated his life in a celibate vocation already. And it was told that he would go around the hospital cheering the other children up, becoming friends with them and praying for them. Meanwhile, undergoing the excruciating pain of bone cancer. And he would wind up dying in that hospital. Greater works than these you will do. We recently heard about Cardinal Pell being released from prison in Australia, overcoming the odds that were stacked against him, a whole judiciary and legal and law enforcement system of that country seemed to go set against him. And thankfully, justice prevails, and he is set free. Greater works than these you shall do. And what the fathers say, and what the catechism lays out, is that these greater works are these sacraments that we partake in. The sacraments are these even greater miracles. St. Thomas Aquinas says that for the justification of the wicked is a greater work than the creation of heaven and earth. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to take that to my prayer today because just that line is enough to fuel this great gratitude to God that the justification of the wicked is a greater work than the creation of heaven and earth. Why? Why? Because heaven and earth are going to pass away. But the salvation of the just, the justification of the elect will not pass away. Even the raising of the dead, even the raising of the dead to life, which is a miracle, is almost nothing in comparison with the resurrection of a soul, which has been lying spiritually dead in sin and has now been raised to the essentially supernatural life of grace. And St. Augustine mirrors this, this sentiment too. He says, the justification of the ungodly is something greater than the creation of heaven and earth, greater even than the creation of the angels. That means that the hearing of one confession of someone who goes from being in mortal sin to, to grace again, is greater than the creation of the universe. The earth will pass, but making someone righteous will last forever. Recently, someone was uh, asking me, you know, well, why do I, why does my child have to go to confession if, to go to First Holy Communion? Can't they just go to God? And in my mind came the story of Matteo Farina, a young Italian youth who the Holy Father is advancing in the cause of holiness, who was eight years old and went to penance often. He went to confession frequently. He's from Southern Italy. And he was close to the word of God. When he was nine years old, he decided to read this, the Gospel of St. Matthew for his Lenten practice. Nine years old, taking up the Gospel of St. Matthew. This is gonna be my Lenten practice. I'm gonna to go to confession frequently. Nine years old, my brothers and sisters. He gets it. I went to faith like Matteo. I want Father Matteo to have the faith of Matteo. He would pray the rosary every day. Every day the rosary. And he heard St. Padre Pio tell him in a vision and a dream, who is without sin is happy so that we can all go together happy to the kingdom of heaven. And then he would go out and try to spread this message to his friends. Nine years old, my brothers and sisters. How do these greater works come about? They come about in and through the church. And Acts, the book of Acts shows us today what's going on there. What's the crisis going on in the church there, right? It's like some racism, right, between the Hellenists and the Jews. It's unclear why the widows are being neglected. And the, and the, and the, the apostles say, let's not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve a table. 
Select among yourselves and will appoint them to this task. So what is the reaction of the church? What's the reaction of the church here? Because it tells us where our priorities should be. The apostles knew that it was contrary to their vocation to neglect the preaching of the gospel in order to manage the material affairs of the community, as good as that is. Right? The proclamation of the bread of life takes precedence over the distribution of bread which perishes. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the priorities of the apostles should be the priorities of the church as, whole, as a whole, right? But how often have we seen the church in recent times fall into t- of the temptation to neglect the word of God in order to distribute the food and the medicine, right? Becoming what Pope Francis has described it, right? As like a massive NGO. That's not our vocation. As good at that, as, as that work is, my brothers and sisters, that's not our vocation. And the reason why this happens is easy to understand, isn't it? Because no one objects to the giving of food and medicine, and we should give it. Everyone appreciates it, and it wins praise from society and from our Lord. But the preaching of conversion to Christ, the preaching of faith in Jesus, the preaching of eternal life, brings with it opposition and controversy and persecution, doesn't it? So long as the church mutes her message about salvation, she can purchase for herself a role in society that's pleasing to others, but at the expense of what? Of her primary mission. In the the past 50, 60 years, large parts of the Catholic Church have given up preaching the gospel. They've often changed their mission from proclaiming Jesus to something else, giving up talking about him. We have to stay focused. We have to know this passage very well because what the apostles are doing here, they're showing us the priorities. What makes the church unique, and Jesus is the unique, the way, the truth, and the life. He's unique, so too the church is unique in that we bear what? We bear the message of eternal life, Jesus. That we can help you live not just longer in this life, we can help you live forever. This is the primary message we have to offer humanity. And this has to take priority. Today, too, we've mentioned this is Mother's Day, and I'm gonna give a special blessing to all our mothers here today, and our entire county, and those watching at home. You know, our lady, she had hope in the way, the truth, and the life. She had hope that her secret conception would be revealed to Joseph that there would be room in Bethlehem, that there would be a place for them in Egypt after their flight, that on Calvary, there would be the hope of the resurrection. She had hope that the newborn church could convert a pagan world. She had hope in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. She's our joy. She is the, she's the, she's the dawn. She is under so many titles. We could say them all right here and not nearly fill our mouth with what she is. And St. Bernard has this beautiful, beautiful paragraph here that I want to read about Our Lady on this Mother's Day. He says, If the winds of temptation blow, if you run against the reefs of temptation, look at the star, call on Mary. If the waves of pride, of ambition, or of envy are breaking over you, look at the star, call on Mary. If anger, greed, or impurity are violently shaking the ship of your soul, turn to Mary. If you are dismayed at the thought of your sins, confounded by the ugliness of your conscience, fearful at the idea of judgment, and you begin to sink into a bottomless abyss of sadness or of despair, think of Mary. When in, when in danger, anguish, or in doubt, think of Mary. Invoke Mary. Let Mary always be on your lips. May she never be absent from your heart. To obtain her help and her intercession, always follow the example of her virtues. You will not go astray if you follow her. You will not despair if you call to her. You will not get lost if you think about her. If she is holding you by the hand, you will not fall. If she is protecting you, you have nothing to fear. You will not grow weary if she is your guide. You will reach port safely she is looking after you because she always leads us to Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life.
Spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. 
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O oh God, who by the wonderful exchange effected in this sacrifice have made us partakers of the one supreme Godhead, grant, we pray, that as we have come to know your truth, we may make it ours by a worthy way of life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb, who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people, exalts in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Plenis Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Gregory, our Bishop, and all those who hold into the truth and on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer for themselves and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying our homage to you, the eternal God living in truth, in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and count among the flock of those you've chosen. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Be 
pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven. To you, O God, as the mighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, Offer to your glorious majesty and the gifts that you've given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim, in humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, to command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy power and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. To us also, your servants, who those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At 
at the Savior's command and form by divine teaching we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Adios Dei. Quit holis peccata mundi. Miserere nobis. Adios Dei. Quit holis peccata mundi. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
invite all the mothers to please stand. And I am looking so much forward to when all the mothers get back from the parish life and look at you in the eye here, or wherever you are, at home watching with your family. Let's let our mothers stand up now. We can never repay at all what our mothers have given to us. And so we honor them and bless them this day. And we give great thanks to God for giving us our mothers. Christ's arm. 